they're here. Hey, Awkward Not Sad. Thank you. I, uh, I'm very, very amused that Pretzel Rocks played Ding Dong Merrily on High, and, um, one of the censors in my chat decided to block it, saying it had a, uh, it, it had a hostile word in it, and that word was dong. It's, uh, yeah. Anyway, hey, Matt WBT, hey, Fire Rider, hey, Sybil Rose. I am very sorry. Uh, if you saw on the Discord or on Twitter, I had some people doing some stuff in the house, and in deference and respect for them and for myself and for safety, I was in the basement while they were here, which meant I couldn't do anything. Hey, Kevin. <laughs> Hey, Brian. I, uh, I'm still struggling with all the various bots that do uh, various helpful things that are not always helpful. Thank you for following, Brian. Um, so yeah, this is... I, I, I'm back to... I should be writing. Uh, yesterday I talked a little bit about how November pretty much kicked my ass. It was bad for... Um, for writing reasons, for professional reasons, travel reasons, everything kind of fell apart. Um, I'll be discussing this more on Discord. Uh, thanks for following, Ellen Orchard. And Frigg's daughter, hey, happy non-Monday, exactly. Hey, Spy Scribe. It was, uh, let's see. My agent and I parted ways, which was rough. Um, she has decided to stop being an agent. So it's not like there was anything bad on either end. She just had to leave the business and which was rather a shock. So uh, that, that put a lot of uncertainty in the rest of the month. So that pretty much killed both my plans to do regular uh, support podcast for NaNoWriMo and writing NaNoWriMo itself. So, um, hey, Indigo Quill. Hey, Billy Boy. Good to see everybody. Uh, so it was fun doing the live writes. And I am considering how to work that into my streaming schedule for the year. Because uh, it was really, really motivational. I know some people dropped into the stream and went, what's going on? This is weird. But uh, I think for me, it was when I was really upset and worried about how to get a new agent, um, my uh, knowing I had to stream and knowing I had to do a live write was very helpful. And I know some people did show up and join me in the live write. So that was good too. I'm taking these off because I'm only listening to Christmas music and I think I look silly with headphones on. Uh, so I, I may continue to do the live write because it just got me going, which was good. Um, oh, that's great to hear, Fire Rider. I'm glad you got, uh, a lot done. So we're back on I Should Be Writing live twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday. And I've been thinking, um... This sounds so juvenile or, you know, kindergarten, but I, I've been thinking a lot about the actual power of words that we don't think about a lot. We, um, they're, and you see it in everything from news to propaganda to just, a handful of words without, you know, it's like dog whistles. It's, it's the handful of words that don't say something offensive, but everybody knows. For example, um, in the news, if something happens, if something bad happens to a woman, depending on how the news organization feels about her, they may, and, and, and of course, if she has children, 
you know, they'll, they'll say like mother of three and in, instead of local woman. And, and on one hand, that's a descriptor, sure, but it's also designed to tug at, you know, that, that ingrained feeling we have of woman is worth this, but mother and wife are worth this. So using words like that create more uh, emotional reaction. You see it a lot, unfortunately, with um, different things that happen to people of different races. No, the same things that happen to people of different races happens a lot. Um, I mean, we, there, there are many, many, many recent examples from this year, but the one that sticks out to me is uh, somebody found two pictures of people from Hurricane Katrina, and there was a white person walking through the floods carrying diapers. And it's like, hur hurricane survivor, you know, tries to bring diapers home. And a black person was carrying the diapers, and it's like, looters do this. And it's, yeah, you remember those two photos? Yeah. So that, you know, comes up in writing as well. And, and um, you, need, you need to think about what you say and how you say it, but also in your narrative voice. Um, I was recently rereading Connie Willis's Just Like the Ones We Used to Know, which is one of my favorite Christmas stories. And it's a series of vignettes about um, the science fiction premise is it snows everywhere on Christmas Eve, everywhere. And the vignettes are about a, a couple of scientists who are trying to get funding for a climate change uh, uh, project. And then you've got a um, Hispanic single mom in L.A. who's... X is trying to get full custody of the kid and the snow affects her situation. And then you've got a funny situation, you know, it's, it's a, a, about a guy trying to cook a goose for his family and nobody can show up except for his aunt, who's very, uh, who's always been the, the, the quiet one and he finally gets to know her and it's very funny. But my point is, is that um, this is one of those things that I've, I've either read or listened to the audiobook countless times. More than one time every season since it came out. I love this story so much. But one thing I caught this time is because there's so many points of view, the way... It's all third person, but the way she presents each person is that you can you can tell what the narrator thinks about people by listening to the narrative voice and it's not like as as obvious as this bitch did that or something but when one guy is is describing a newscaster it's a blonde with a tight red sweater when somebody else is describing a newscaster it's a shivering person in a raincoat in the snow and I started paying attention to it and every s single person, it, it's a very subtle thing. There, there's a part where a woman is uh, in a wedding and she's in love with the groom and the viola player. Because of the snow, he's the only one who can show up and he starts hitting on her. We never get his name. Everybody else in the show, in the thing is named, including people who don't show up to the wedding. We hear about these people a lot. But the viola player is always the viola player, and I realize it's because she is not seeing him. She's just not. And Connie Willis is a uh, master, I mean, literally, a grandmaster of science fiction. And... I always learn something when I read her, even when I reread her. But this is one of those things where even if you just, if it just sounds like you're describing a scene, the word you choose will say something about the narrative voice. Unfortunately, some people may think that that narrative voice is you, the author, 
I don't think Connie Willis is the kind of person to describe women as, you know, making sure she talks about their bodies all the time. And so I got that impression about the guy who was narrating the scene because he was actually lying to his wife about being able to come home on Christmas Eve so he could sleep with somebody else. That was a really good vignette. That one was really awesome. Um, so, uh, Ready Player Two is really bad about describing women. I've been rereading a lot of Stephen King's lately, and, and his... I mean, he, he's brilliant, and his... <laughs> okay, okay, Kimmy, I'll tell you in a minute. Um... But, at least in the early stuff, he I've complained about this before, he has to tell you what every woman's breasts look like. Old, young, alive, dead. We know all about all of their breasts. All of them. Uh, we're talking about the power of words, Kay Kimmy, and how I'm using the description of the Connie Willis story, just like the ones we used to know, as it's a vignette... It's a series of vignettes with a lot of different uh, third-person narrative voices. And if you pay attention, you can, you can get a sense of who the person is by how they describe people. So the guy who describes people, who describes the newscaster as a, a woman in a tight red sweater, you, you think one thing about him and, and there's a woman who doesn't even gives somebody a name in her vignette, and I realized she's basically saying that he doesn't exist. Um, I had a similar reading, a certain fantasy author, first time missed of a rereading, he spent way too much time talking about the details of certain characters. Yeah. Unfortunately, if you don't... Th this is why you have to think about the words you use, and it's already hard to write, you know? It's already rough to um, tell a story in all the words that just come to your head. But when you don't, you become the author that talks about the boobs all the time. And when you do, you layer in information about the characters without ever having to actually say anything. And It's like maybe something you do on second or third edit if you don't think about it while you're writing. The sweater clung to her ample though on <laughs> though not un ample though not unnoticeable. Ample though not unnoticeable. That's trying to say they're big and small at the same time. Yeah, no. I'm Yeah. Yeah, so the the whole the whole idea of of I mean, it sounds obvious to say the words we choose are very important, but when it comes to whether you describe a person as a man or a woman or envy or trans masculine or trans feminine or you know, it, once you start adding those things people can you know depending on where you put them and how you put them is um really bring something across you know the office does that with uh michael scott talking about uh the the a character's gay son and he has to say the, the gay son and that tells you something about Michael Scott. Um, oh, you made that up with the sweater. Okay. Because a lot of times you, you can bring things across in narrative without ever having to say anything about something. You can tell somebody has an anger problem by mentioning the vein that sticks out, how everybody else reacts when the person gets angry, and maybe the mark on the wall that he always hits. You don't have to say, this guy always is angry. Thanks for following Orinx, Orinx1. Um, instead of saying, you know, uh, uh, you've got a female doctor or a male nurse, you know, it, you just, 
you you can say something without saying something that blatantly. The doctor showed up and my dad asked her a question. Just little things like that. And oftentimes after you finish a story, you want so much to be done. You want to be done with it. You want to be done with it. You want to send it out. You want to look at something else. But it's, it's, it's attention to detail. It's attention to the word you use that really levels up your writing. And... Um, that's really what I have to say about that. I've just been thinking, I've been watching in the news who they describe as a mother and who they don't. And it, it always interests me. I, I kind of went on the path from that. Um, so that's my thought on language. Is there anything anybody wants to talk about? I haven't actually done it. I should be writing for a month. A lot of people did NaNoWriMo. A lot of people won NaNoWriMo. Um, I know at least a couple of those are were in chat earlier. I don't know if they're there now, but congratulations if you won NaNoWriMo. As I said, I did not. <laughs> and uh, luckily I did get an extension from my editor, so that's good. Yeah, November. November was kind of 2020 distilled. And you know, I, it wasn't even that bad. I didn't get sick. No one lost a job. It, nobody else got sick. It was still stressful. But we are at the end of our isolation after driving to get our kid. Um, I get my test on Thursday. And then we'll be more comfortable going out. And the exciting thing is I'll get to go to a grocery store and buy a Christmas tree. Yeah, okay. It's not... Getting the freedom to come out of isolation is not... <laughs> There's not really a lot of places to go. Did I do... Will I do a NaNoWriMo balance? Uh, hey, Pablo, what do you mean a NaNoWriMo balance? Can you, can you explain that a little bit more? Because I certainly didn't have it this year. I am a... a if you don't know, I'm a chronic NaNoWriMo loser. I really love it. I love supporting people who do it. I just, uh, yeah. I've never won. <laughs> never. Came close one time, but never won. Glad you're being cautious. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I feel very strongly about that. I felt weird when a lot of people were ignoring the CDC and, and flying and stuff. I, if I told anybody I was traveling, I'm just like, yeah, we're traveling. We're getting in the car and we're driving for 12 hours and we're picking up our kid. And then we're driving back for 12 hours and then we're isolating for a week. So, you know, it was not, there was no mixing with, with people except for our child. So a balance of the work, how it went for me. Um... Well, I don't know if you got if you heard earlier, Pablo, but I started working on NaNoWriMo and then my I I got stressed out by the election, how it did not, you know, happen and then end, how it just kind of dragged on. That stressed me out and then um I lost my agent, so that was stressful and then we decided to drive to Boston and that just planning for that trip and then doing the trip and then recovering from the trip that was so it, it was not it was not a, a triumphant NaNoWriMo and some people laugh at me because one reason to you to do NaNoWriMo is to see whether you can is to give you a, a project that you can start and finish and show you that you can do a big project you can write a book and I know I can write a book but there's just something about the community aspect of NaNoWriMo and I love being around, I mean, obviously from this podcast, I love being around new writers. I love supporting new writers and I love being around that energy of NaNoWriMo. So yeah, I'll sign up every year. Maybe next year will be my year. I don't know. So it was not, um, not, not the best balance for me. There was, there was a lot of 
yeah, a lot of weight kind of bearing me down uh, in the month, and I'm just trying to Okay. Sorry, the auto mod is really, really uh, rough today. Uh, hey, Collectonian. Not a little, you're still crying each year and it's clear you still enjoy and support it. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, you're right. I'm not a loser, especially since, like I said, with the live write-ins, I got more done than I would have otherwise. Because there were days when I'm just like, I've already accepted that I'm not going to hit 50k. Things are bad. I'm stressed out. But I said I'd do a live write-in, so I'll do it. And I came and I did it, and I did it for the people who showed up for the live write-in. But I also got it, um, got words down myself, and I wouldn't have. And, and I always say, if you if, if NaNoWriMo makes you write more words than you would have otherwise, it, it's a win. Lost track of the streams, etc. Just wanted to know. Oh, no problem. Yeah. That it's it's stuff I I talk about. That's it's I I'm sorry I can't give you a more triumphant story, but uh, yeah. Try to stay, okay, Kimmy. Try to stay careful. Found out last week my best friend's whole family got COVID. Oh no! Oh, I'm so sorry, Kay Kimmy. When Aunt came to help her grandmother. Yeah, it's yeah. Oh, and Trisby found somebody who was at a rally the same week. They got, they tested positive. Did they at least test, did they test positive after the rally or before? You want to talk about a couple of words judging somebody. That's, it. <laughs> that's, um, oh, no, no, no. That's not good. I don't think any of us here tried anything, although Ursula finished a book yesterday. Does that count? Ursula does like 2,000 words a day, every day. So, Ursula, yes, it counts. But, but, you know, when you're doing NaNoWriMo every single month, I, 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 yeah, you, you can just tell her that, uh, that facial expression. It's made with love, you know that. Yes, Ursula finished a book yesterday. The election was hard and I'm not even from the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks for following, Matt. Uh, tested positive that Sunday and I talked with them later that week to check on them and they were at a grocery store and had gone to the rally. Oh. Oh. That just that just makes me sad. I, I think about, I mean, yay, a virus is a virus, huh? A vaccine is coming, which is great. But I think about the people who can't take it. Um, I've got a family member who can't have a flu shot, and I'm assuming they can't have the COVID vaccine either. They're very immunocompromised, and you know, I it's like when the virus when the vac why do I keep doing that? They're both V words. When the vaccine comes out, you know, everyone's going to feel like I can go out again. But I don't know when they're going to feel comfortable doing it because they're going to have to trust everybody else doing it. Mirror Universe number three. Okay, Evil Mur has a thing to say. I just wish my stream deck would be faster. Evil Mur advice number three. Evil Merch says, follow agents to the bathroom at conventions. That's the best time to pitch your book. To make a stronger point, steal all the TP from the bathroom before you do so, so they will be at your mercy. That's from Evil Mer. Don't follow her advice. At all. <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> It's evil mer, Kevin. This is not me. It's evil mer advice. People spend channel points for those things. You did one time get accosted by an... Wow. Wow, Spice Scribe. You know that you're an, a writer 
that that's hot stuff if you get accosted by an agent. Can you tell us any more about that story? You don't have to name names. But uh you're we had met before. It was mostly social. Okay, that's not that bad. Were they were they trying to to get you as a client or were they just going, "Hey, remember me?" Chatting at the sinks for 10 minutes. So it's not like you were there completely against your will. But that is a weird thing to have. Oh, no client pitch. Okay. Still a weird thing to happen in the bathrooms. Just because the world is so literal right now, I feel the need to say, when we do evil, Mer says, she gives very bad advice. Don't. Please don't do it. It don't. No. I don't think I'm allowed at industry party since I talked to ancients without any ulterior motives at all. Yeah, I was, uh, I was, this, I, actually, I shouldn't say this because I don't swear on this podcast. Um, I, I, th there's, there's a term for getting in the way of somebody who's flirting with somebody. It's kind of rude. And when I see agents that I like as people at cons, I feel guilty if ever I like go up to them at the bar and talk to them because I feel like they're probably there to meet possible clients and there's probably a lot of writers kind of hoping to chat them up and I'm just wasting everybody's time just by being friendly. But uh, when I said that to an agent, he laughed and, and said, you know, I'm, I'm allowed to talk to a friend. So that was good. One or two writers may still want to murder me for Worldcon 2012. Which one was that? Is that Chicago? Or is that Reno? That was Reno. Wasn't it? Oh god, I can't remember. You have to remind me, Kevin. Uh, even at the time I remember thinking I'm living at the flip side of a cliche right now, yes. <laughs> What's a way to stop compulsively checking emails for updates on queries and pitches? Um, on a mental level, start working on your new book. Plotting, writing, whatever. On an actual tactile level, uh, go in and turn off alerts and turn off uh, whether notifications go to your phone um, keep your email client down when you're at your computer. I mean, it's, if you shut everything down, you're less likely to be, uh, obsessive about checking it. When I was really addicted to Twitter, but it was either wasting my time or making me upset, I actually logged out because I have two-factor authentication on Twitter, and it's a pain in the ass to log in. So... Making it harder to check tweets was, um, yeah, making it harder to check tweets was, was helpful for me, getting me away from Twitter. Tour Party Chicago. D&D Mode is your friend. Yeah, I don't think I went to that party. Yeah, yeah, Chicago was, was where... Yeah, that was a lot of red wine. My editor bought me a lot of red wine that night. A lot of red wine. Yeah, that hurt. That hurt. Um, and just, and also, Matt, remember that... Um, when you're wanting something to happen in anything, but specifically publishing, you want it now. You're very, very uh, Veruca Salt here. And publishing moves at a glacial pace on a good year. And then that glacial pace turned into something very fast because it got slower than the glacial pace this year because of pandemic and the election. And now we're in the holidays and Often publishing slows even more in uh, December and 
August. Those are the two slowest months for publishing. So even now, you, you just got to remind yourself that it's just going to be a while. I turned in my book in September. I think it was September. And I still haven't gotten edits back. So, and I know it's because everything slowed down. Don't remember saying some authors were looking daggers at me for monopolizing an agent's conversation for like 15 minutes. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> well, you know, I, I guess they just don't know that, that Kevin, my friend Kevin makes friends with anybody, anywhere, of any language, whether he speaks it or not. No, stop being mean to Kevin. God. Sorry. Yes, so Kevin, Kevin will talk to anybody, make friends with anybody. I, I believe I, you, you made friends with somebody during your uh, China trip, right? And you didn't speak the same language, you didn't speak anything of the same language, but you and she were just like, Buddy, buddy. Had something to do with head scars, didn't it? I don't know. I heard the story from Ursula. But yeah, it's, uh... The moral of this story is, if you see... If you see Kevin talking to an agent at, uh, at a convention, you should just go say hi. You know, because Kevin will make friends with you and he won't mind you talking to the agent if you actually need to do it, you know, for networking and career purposes. And you'll make a friend and Kevin's pretty cool. Oh, Zambia and Botswana and, Botswana and Berlin and Taiwan. Yeah. Kevin. Kevin makes friends with everybody. Everybody loves Kevin. And they should. Hey, cybernetic crack. And Streamlabs is apparently on the side of the angry authors. I am trying with Streamlabs, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, like, I don't want to turn everything off because I know once I do that, some rando is going to find my chat and run in and start doing terrible things. And, you know, I'm not big enough for moderators, so I'm going to have to be watching that and, and fighting with it. And I, so I want to have some limits, but you know, when my friends come in, or when Pretzel Rocks wants to play Ding Dong Merrily on High, I... I suppose all the bots is, is a... Using them is, is, is a learned skill, I assume. Anyway. Yeah, it's hard to, to balance that whole friendly networking thing at a convention. You gotta be really, really good at, like, reading body language and stuff. There's the whole, like, two people who are really into a conversation, um, and you can tell they don't want to be interrupted. And then there's two people at a bar talking that would be just fine if you walked up. One time... To err is human, to err on the side of caution is bot. Yes, exactly. Um, I remember I was uh, really wanting to get Charlene Harris for a an interview on my podcast. And I saw her at a con, but she was at a table with a man I knew was her agent. And it was a two-person table, and... Being Charlene Harris, a lot of people still wanted to go up to her and say hi, but I could, just by reading the room, you could tell that she and her agent were in an intense discussion. And I thought, that's, that's not something I should interrupt. And I actually mentioned it on Twitter after the con, and Charlene Harris responded saying, thank you, that was a very important conversation. I appreciate you not interrupting. So, uh, yeah, good call. It still felt... Weird and awkward that she responded to that, but, uh, yeah. I, I love that we're talking about convention etiquette during a pandemic. Yay. 
High five for social awareness, yes. And, you know, if you're not somebody who reads people well, you know, I don't think it would be a bad thing to ask somebody else. It's like, do you think it'd be okay just to go up and say, tell those people? Because I can't tell if they're, like, in a I don't want to be disturbed conversation. There's enough awkward people in science fiction that, you know, if somebody asked me that, I, you know, be happy to try to read the room for them. Or if I knew the people involved, I'd go introduce them. Um, sometimes hanging a lantern on the, the awkwardness is more useful than making a guess. Yeah, K. Okay, Kimmy, a lot of people are afraid of disturbing people. I have that problem at con sometimes. Um... But more often than not, if you're just, if you're friendly and you go up and say hi, and if someone says, okay, I'm going to head off to the tour party now, and they don't invite you, then you can say, great, have fun, and, and if they do invite you, then great. Um, I wish people were afraid of disturbing me sometimes. Gavin, you look like a biker. Whatever you do... To be as approachable as you are, while still being bald-bearded biker dude, it's amazing. You need to frown more, I think. Not with anything chicken-like around you, either. But, K. Kimmy, it's like, if, you, if you've got somebody at a con who's, is like, they're an author and they're sitting alone and they're at, with their computer and they're looking at their computer, then maybe not. But, you know, if people are just standing around in a loose group and talking, then coming over and saying hi and introducing yourself is uh, usually just fine. If you do that to an author who's been published for the first time within the past three or five years, you will make them feel like a rock star. It's, it's, I know it, it's hard for some people to go up and say, hey, I just want to say, I'm a big fan. I really loved your book. Um, you think you're being awkward, but you're making their day. So, yeah. If, if you need that, the, if, if... Yeah, do that. Because... A lot of times we put out books and it's like... It's the dream come true, but then... Unless you're... One of the rare people, you know, your first book is not going to hit huge. And then if you actually hear that someone was aware of it and liked it, it's, it's, it's a really nice uh, encouragement to keep going. So does anybody else have any writing questions or anything they want to talk about? Danarimo, the upcoming month, whatever you're going to do to dig a hole and throw 2020 into it and cover it up and set the hole on fire. And I don't know how you set a hole on fire, but I bet we could figure it out for 2020. 2020, the year we set holes on fire. No. That one didn't work. Pit fires. Okay, that's better. That makes more sense. <laughs> hey, Finn Mill. Gas. Pour gas in the hole. There we go. It's a thing. Okay. Is it like just throwing trash in the fire? Throwing... Get the guys from Supernatural to come help. <laughs> You know, I've never seen Supernatural. Everything I know about it is from pop culture discussions, and it's never been something I've wanted to watch. But I'm always surprised. It feels like every year they're going to end the series. An old way of firing pottery, that's right. I remember now. Yeah, the... the I feel like Supernatural says it's going to end every year. I hear it actually did end, 
but I, I won't believe it until next year when I hear it's going to end again. But I think I am out of conversation. I'm out of, uh, I should be writing stuff to talk about. Um... It actually did end. Big goodbye episode and everything. I heard there was some uh, anger between some stuff that was cut out of the English edition that was kept in on the Spanish edition. You may have watched all 15 seasons. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. Possibly. Um, but anyway, this is I Should Be Writing. Back, finally, after a month of attempting live writing and more just being wretched. Um, I do this show live every Tuesday and Thursday, 1230, unless circumstances hit like they did today, 1230 Eastern Time. Uh, it is the podcast for wannabe writers. And uh, my name is Mer Lafferty. My website is merverse.com. If you're listening to this or watching on YouTube later, you can catch it live on Twitch, twitch.tv slash mightymer. And, um, no, wait, we got a question. When you do a rewrite, do you write, rewrite the entire story or just parts of the story that aren't strong? That is uh, a good question, but it really depends on how it is. I don't know anybody who does like a complete rewrite. Um, you, you, you pick the stuff that you want to keep and you rewrite the stuff or toss it out that, that need to change. And... There are different sizes of rewrites. There are some small tweaks and some, like, uh, I believe Paolo Bacigalupi once told me that his edit on The Wind-Up Girl was like cutting something open, removing an organ, and putting everything back in perfectly and making the body continue to work just fine. Um, it was... And then he won the Hugo for it, so I guess he did some good surgery. But... Uh, it, it really depends on the size of the edit and and what's required. So it's, but I don't know anybody who actually starts from like word one and rewrites the whole thing. But uh, yeah, so I am here for your writing questions. You can either email me or show up live and ask me questions. And I'm doing uh, Christmas watch parties over December where I talk about Christmas uh, rom-coms and uh, make fun of them and try to do, try to catch the tropes that are uh, in many of them. Many, so, so many tropes. And play bingo and try to raise money for Extra Life. So um, I'm raising money for Duke Children's Hospital and also just watching funny Christmas movies. It may be... Uh, Limited by your region. I don't know how that works because it all it has to be movies on Amazon Prime But also if you want to play bingo with me or if you just want to play bingo if you're watching your own Christmas romance That's not on Amazon Prime then um, I actually made bingo cards and They're very it was very fun to make and we, we had Discovered during Anna the Apocalypse that people if it's not a rom-com people really want to stretch the rules with um yeah like did that count if, if santa's a zombie does that mean santa's real because there's magic involved and little things like that a lot of people like to find loopholes there that was fun but um yeah so my schedule is on uh twitch and i'll be putting it on my website so um yeah, I guess that's everything. Thank you all so much for dropping by and continuing to support my podcast and support my uh, channel on Twitch. And I hope I will see you guys on uh, Thursday for the next episode of I Should Be Writing.